What's up, guys, and welcome back to another episode of I'll Call You Right Back podcast with me, your host. My name is Chad Medved. Welcome to my podcast. Uh, if you are new here, welcome. And uh, if you are a returning listener, welcome back. Uh, I appreciate everyone that comes back each and every week to listen to me talk to interesting people in the city about what they do and how they got to that point in life. Um, first thing is first, if you enjoy the podcast and uh, you enjoy it whatsoever, please take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. That is the biggest thing that you could do to help me out. Uh, Each week, this podcast is free. I do this on top of my regular job, on top of my relationship, on top of my life, and uh, this is a passion project. And if you could rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. That is all I ask of you. Um, Actually, one more thing I ask of you. Turner Dairy Farms, they are sponsors of the podcast, and they have incredible stuff. You know, incredible stuff. If you've never had a Turner's tea, or if you've never had a Turner's milk, you just, you have not been living. And uh, this is your last chance to run out to the store and get the Oakmont flavored limited edition Turner Oakmont Bakery collaboration milk. That is a mouthful. But the Oakmont is the signature uh, baked good from Oakmont Bakery. And uh, Turner Dairy Farms teamed up with them to bring you the Oakmont flavored milk, and it's pretty damn good. And the only thing, or the only ones that are on the shelves right now in the store, are the last of them. Um, they are sold out uh, as of production. But if you find them on the shelf, Those are the last ones you'll be able to get, so grab them while you can. But, okay, so I have to preface this podcast and apologize because, you know, I... You know, I I hold myself to a certain standard with this podcast. Uh, I really do. And, you know, due to the pandemic and due to the, you know, everyone with COVID, you know, sometimes I, I, you know, I try to schedule people in here uh, to do in-house interviews, but, you know, sometimes you just can't. So this week we have, uh, we have a great interview, but it's a phone interview. And, uh, you know, with phone interviews, sometimes the sound cuts out. And I just wanted to say I sincerely apologize for any sort of sound cutting out that you might experience with this episode. But nonetheless, this is a fantastic episode with a fantastic person. So this week, I sit down with Katie, who is one half of Leona's Ice Cream Sandwiches. Katie and Krista are partners in this incredible business and partners in life. And uh, they have been doing uh, Leona's Ice Cream Sandwiches since 2013. And I mean, if you have never had a Leona's Sandwich, it is absolutely worth the trip. Uh, Get out there. You could find all of their stuff on their website, uh, www.com leonaspgh.com and uh, on their website they have a tab that uh, will tell you the locations and you could find them in all sorts of places around the city so if you are not familiar with leona's a leona's ice cream sandwich is a delicious treat that is two homemade cookies and one giant serving of homemade ice cream and whenever i say an ice cream sandwich I know that some of those, some of some people might think that an ice cream sandwich. Oh, how could how good could an ice cream sandwich be? Let me tell you, Leona's does. I mean, they go above and beyond with creativity and with just the quality of their their product. Um, their flavors rotate in and out all the time. Um, like right now, they have black sesame on salted tahini chocolate chunk cookies. They got brownie sundae on chocolate chunk cookies. They have uh, cinnamon oatmeal lace ice cream. Cinnamon, cinnamon oatmeal lace on a cookie. You got chocolate on a peanut butter. Uh, you got coffee ice cream. You got cookies. You got cookie cream on chocolate wafer. Uh, lavender and honeycomb. Like, these flavors that Leona's put out are absolutely just ridiculous. Um, like I said, you think of an ice cream sandwich, you think of a, you know, something chocolate with vanilla ice cream on it, or you think of like, you know, a generic type of flavor, but these are not that. These are the furthest thing from that. So every ice cream that they have is made 100% 
with real dairy, 100% lactose free. So if you're lactose intolerant, these are the ice cream sandwiches for you. Um, and they are, like I said, available all over the city. And this week I sit down with Katie to talk about, you know, the legacy that is Leona's. Um, we talk about everything from where the name came from to how they even got involved with, you know, creating ice cream sandwiches and how they became a huge business in the city and how they are in 50 plus retailers, you know, they're in, I mean, all over, literally all over. They just told me that they got some of them in West Virginia even, but, uh, it is a great episode and I am very excited about it. And again, I have to apologize for any sort of audio issues that might arise in here. Um, I try my best. I try to, you know, make it sound the best. And I just want you guys to understand that there's only so much that I could do, but I appreciate everyone listening. And I hope you enjoy the episode as much as I did, because Katie was great to talk to. And, uh, it was really interesting to hear about how someone comes up with a black sesame ice cream sandwich and how people, you know, you know, how people develop the creativity to go above and beyond just a regular thing. I mean, they got everything. Key lime on graham cracker, like, oh my goodness, toasted coconut, sweet mint on chocolate wafer, like goodness. Um, but again, I appreciate everyone listening as usual. I know that you will enjoy the podcast as much as I did. And, uh, you know, without further ado, episode 152 of I'll Call You Right Back podcast with Katie from Leona's Ice Cream Sandwiches. I gotta use the telephone. Hello? I'll call you right back, podcast. Does that sound a little bit better? Yes. Okay. Um, I appreciate you doing this with me today. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, it's been a little little wild no i completely get it and i uh i understand you know i'm just trying to adapt as i'm sure every person in this uh pandemic is trying to do you know it's kind of kind of impossible to run a good podcast without being able to do in-person interviews so uh i'm adapting and trying to make it work as best as i can yeah it's tricky however i did learn something the other day you did what? Um, you know, I learned something the other day. Do you know who Terry Gross is? Terry Gross. Yeah, I, she's like an NPR personality. She has fresh air. She's been doing it for like 20 years or something like that. Um, she never records her radio interviews in person. Really? They're always like in a separate studio. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I, so, that's pretty interesting I to think about. No, so uh, maybe there's something to it. There might I be something know. to it. There might be something to it. And there's so many people that are doing it like uh, they're doing it that way now because, I mean, no one really wants to, you know, interview with someone in person because of, uh, you know, all the precautions that need to be taken, which is completely understandable. Yeah, yeah. Um, I prefer it, but. Prefer to stay healthy too. I know, I know. That's what uh, that's what the goal is because you know everyone has to uh, you know try to maneuver this this whole pandemic and not get anyone else sick. I'm trying to do the same things, and you know I try to limit yeah. the I try to limit the ways that I go out, and uh, you know uh, I don't know, just try to do whatever I can to make myself and my family a little bit safe. And with you being uh, someone who has a food establishment. Um, I can understand how that is even more important for you. Yes, very important. 
Now, uh, I have to tell you, I am late to the game with uh, Leonis. I'm very late to the game. I've known about you for a very long time, and uh, I've known about your ice cream sandwiches for a very long time, but uh, I just, I don't know, I never came across them until probably the last six months ago around there, six, seven, eight months ago. Uh, I actually seen them at... I actually seen them at Ironborn Pizza at uh, in Millville. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's where it was, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. We've been there for I don't know, I think since they opened. Now, how long have you been in business? And and you are you are part of a, a two person team, right? Yes, yes. My wife and I own the company and I'm I'm sorry, you cut out the last second there. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> we, um, we've been going since 2013. 2013, that long? Yes. Wow, eight yes. years. Um, yeah. Now, you can't, you can't. what is... Uh, you I'm sorry, go ahead. It makes me tired. <laughs> oh, I bet, I bet. It's a... Uh, now, uh, so the first thing that I was curious about just off the bat is... Uh, where does the name come from? Um, Leona was actually our dog. Oh. Um, we, yeah, we rescued a, a 10-year-old boxer, and um, she was kind of a big part of the testing process. Um, she came from a real rough background, and... Uh, so I wasn't real strict on treats with her. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, we did a lot of testing at home. We had a uh, pretty cool Italian machine, like ice cream maker, um, that did some semi-professional level ice cream so we could at least test on proper equipment before we started. And um, every time I turned it on, like this is an old dog, and I had never seen her move so fast. But she heard the machine come on, and she would come running knowing that when I was done, she would get to, like, lick the spoon. I love that. Uh, yeah. So when it came down to it, we had to file our LLC papers. You know, she was, like, sitting under the table with her head on my feet. And I was like, well, you know, Chris and I discussed it and decided it would be a, a nice tribute. I love that. That's such a, uh, that's such a, a cool way to, you know come up with a name yeah yeah we were you know we tossed around all sorts of things but we kind of wanted it to feel nostalgic for you know a gentler time and a time when food and ice cream was a little bit more straightforward and less convoluted with all sorts of crap and artificial stuff so yeah absolutely i think that that's I think it's so cool that, uh, you know, that name will just be with you forever. I mean, obviously, you know, we, we don't, we're not privileged to have dogs for, you know, a long, long, long period of time, but you know, that name is going to live on forever. And that's, uh, that holds a lot of weight to it. I just recently got a dog. Me and my wife just recently got a dog ourselves. We just rescued a dog oh, and, yay. and, uh, I, I immediately, you know, from the moment we got her, it's like my whole life changed and, uh, it's just pretty much all about her now and I love that I know I know my um and we had her for like three years and she made it till we sold our first sandwich and then she was kind of done yeah done with it so well that's so a she, shame she worked out yeah yeah no we had to let her go but we have a new one I saw I saw a picture of that uh you have another boxer right Yes, yeah, my wife grew up with boxers, and I had actually never had a dog before, Leona. Really? So, yeah, she was my first animal, period, besides, like, a goldfish. Yeah, <laughs> a goldfish. So, yeah, so, I mean, I think it counts, but apparently <laughs> most other people are like, that's not a pet, you can't touch it. Yeah, um, I mean, I get, I get the argument yeah. between both of it. Yeah, but yeah. So now we have uh, Ember, another boxer. She's also a rescue. That's a her. 
That's uh, that's awesome. I, I like I like rescuing. Yeah. Uh, I like the idea of a uh, of a rescue. You know, I feel like that uh, it's important to when we were trying to pick out a dog. Like that was always something that was uh, very very uh, close in our mind that we wanted to do is you know find a rescue pup because you know I'm, I'm friends with some people who run uh, really great rescues around the city and I always see the positive stories and you know I always see how. You know, she will. Uh, she runs a rescue called Biggie's Bullies, but like she gets these dogs and. Oh yeah. You know her, Allie. Yeah, um, I don't know her, but I know the organization. Yeah. So she's just a great person, and I've been following her for a long time. And I see her. You know, she finds these dogs that are in like these super negative, bad situations, and you know, she turns out to, you know, give them these lives where they just like completely flourish and. Uh, I don't know. It just makes my heart skip a beat. Yeah, it's it's awesome. You know, Amber, our current dog, wasn't in a super great situation either. So it was nice to give her a good home and lots of treats and soft beds all over the place. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, uh, are you uh, are you and your wife from around here? Um, my wife was born in Pittsburgh and then grew up in. Dallas. Okay. And I am from Minneapolis originally. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Now, how... I uh, coming back. I'm sorry. I'm, I have to apologize uh, to you ahead of time for any time I interrupt you. Uh, it's harder to do an interview over the phone, so I just want to apologize ahead of time. Um, oh, no, that's fine. I get it. It's, it's tricky. You can't see when someone's going to speak. I know, and that's exactly it. I, I, I tend to be someone who, uh, you know, kind of reads the room, so to speak, and, you know, kind of gets the vibe. But And uh, I'm just not a big fan of, you know, Zoom calls. I feel like that, uh, I mean, yeah, you could see each other, but I, I feel that the audio is way worse than what we're doing now. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, could, I ask, uh, could I ask what you and your wife did before you decided to uh, start a ice cream sandwich business? Yeah. So my wife worked in the legal field. Um, she did um, like legal technology and kind of legal work um, for almost 20 years before this. And then I worked in public relations. And um, most recently, like food public relations. So, um, big Fortune 500 food companies. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah. So, I come from like a food adjacent. A food adjacent. Background. That's, a, that's, that's a good way to yeah. say that. <laughs> Most, mostly just public relations. <clears throat> now, like, where does, uh, where does the want to kind of start a business come into play? Like, is this, were you someone who, you know, baked and created ice cream before this, before you had the idea to make this company? Um, kind of. So I've always cooked, I've always baked, um, but being in that kind of food adjacent career, I realized, you know, I was always getting the story to the chefs and getting them you know, placed in magazines and newspapers and promoting different kinds of foods and things like that. And I just realized that I was, I felt like I was on the wrong side of the desk. I wasn't terribly happy in that career choice. And um, I was good at it, so it was hard to leave, but I just didn't like it, you yeah, know? <laughs> like absolutely. It sucked my soul out. So <clears throat> I realized I just wanted to change. I needed to get out of what I was doing and into something else, um, and I knew I wanted to be in food. I just didn't have any clues uh, as to what. So kind of all at the same time, I decided to leave my job, go to a different company that actually owned the um, culinary school in town. So I could at least kind of get the juices flowing and figure out what I wanted to do. Um, so I, I was able to you know, change my job go to school for free, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I have paid for college already. I didn't want to pay for it again. And um, and then also in there, we got married. So as you know, you get all sorts of crazy things for wedding gifts. Absolutely. Um, and we got two ice cream makers. Two of them. And two 
two of them. I returned one. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 got, and got like a frying pan or something stupid. But uh, at first I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I was like, oh, you know what? This kind of sucks because I'm lactose intolerant and I can't eat ice cream. Oh, my. And yeah, so it just kind of like sat there and I bitched about it pretty frequently. Um, and enough so where my wife said, why don't you just figure it out? Basically shut up about it. Please shut up about it. So I took that challenge and I, you know, did a lot of research, did a lot of reading and figured out how to make it and make ice cream lactose free. And um, ultimately I wanted to eat the super premium, beautifully sourced ice cream like graters or Jenny's or, you know, like really high fat content, delicious ice cream. And I couldn't. Oh yeah. And the I good stuff. About it. The good stuff. Yeah. I could never eat it. Like we go out and get ice cream to friends and I'd be like, what's your sorbet? Like, I don't want sorbet. It's good. I like sorbet. But when I want ice cream, I want ice cream. Yeah. So, uh, basically having Krista be like, will you just shut up about it or fix it? <laughs> push me to start tinkering with the ice cream maker and I got you know I got the bug and I loved it um, and kind of at the same time still in culinary school thinking about you know how to do this as a business and it just kind of came together and we decided you know like there's a hole in the market there's no super premium lactose free real dairy ice cream and at that time it was just soy milk, rice milk. There's coconut, which everything then tastes like coconut. Yeah. And um, a ca and very little cashew milk. It wasn't even really out at that time. Um, so all the non-dairy alternatives were kind of chalky and tasteless and just cold, but not real good. Absolutely. You um, could definitely tell so, the difference. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's kind of where we saw a hole in the market. It was something I selfishly wanted to be able to eat for myself. And um, so from there, we just kind of, you know, started started writing a business plan and testing, testing, testing. And it first was supposed to just be ice cream. And then we realized we did not have the capital um, or the resources to start like a storefront. Um, so we needed to have something mobile, something that we could like prepackaged that we could hand out and Krista was like well why don't we do ice cream sandwiches and from there we just kind of like took it and ran as kind of wow creatively and as we know it now like what it looks like obviously we're much larger than we were at that point but yeah 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 you wanted yeah. to create a handheld vessel to you know put your ice cream into the world yeah, I mean, and it's not like ice cream sandwiches are obviously not a new idea. They've been around since the early 1900s, but it's also not a fad. You yeah. know, they've been around since the 1900s. So it was, it, it felt like like a safe format. Absolutely. That we could use to, to, to do what we wanted to do. Now, before you got this ice cream maker uh, for your wedding, like you have no, you had no experience with making ice cream? Um, I mean, when I was a kid, we made ice cream. Um, it was like this big canister that you put salt and ice in the outside, and then the inside was like a, you know, churn it. And, but yeah, outside of that, and, you know, I never really made any ice cream. Wow. That's incredible. Now, yeah. how, how long did it take you to develop a recipe for the ice cream to, to to where you were excited about it and you were like, yeah, this is this is fucking good? Yeah, so I have several recipes that we went through. Um, and basically, within the process, I mean, it took me probably a year to figure out exactly what I wanted. And then it, that was on a very small scale. Yeah. And then I went to um, the Berkey Creamery at Penn State and did the ice cream course. Oh, wow. And, yeah, I'm not sure if you are familiar with that, but that's where 
Ben and Jerry's went. And that's where Jenny's went. That's where like pretty much every major ice cream company um, across the country and some out out of the country um, send people to learn how to make ice cream and learn the science behind it. Because um, that's the thing that a lot of people don't realize how much science there is. There's freezing science, there's dairy science, um, you know, it's a lot of chemistry um, to, to, to get things to where you want them to be delicious as well as, you know, mouthfeel and making sure your ingredients fit together and all that stuff. Um, but, so I took that class and it was like several days long in the grueling days and because it's all science yeah. and um, you learn that in that, that the process of pasteurization and the equipment that you need for it is very expensive and you take on an incredible amount of risk because if you do it wrong you get people sick absolutely um, so what we decided at that at that you know event you meet dairy farmers, you meet, you know, like all sorts of producers from all over the place. Well, I was, and I was able to meet um, a couple of dairy farmers and uh, worked with them to create a mix that worked for us, that tasted the way my mix tasted, yeah. that I made. Um, they have access to the you know, the curves, it's like a cooperative um, dairy in the middle of the state and then, you know, work with all these, like, fantastically, ethically raised cows and, you know, family farms all over the place, um, like, all throughout central Pennsylvania. So they produce it there and then, and then bring it to us. So I don't have to actually do any of that stuff. Um because I don't have the equipment and I also don't have the, you know, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's um, completely understandable. I'm sure that it takes a yeah, ridiculous yeah. amount to uh, be able to do that correctly to where people don't get sick. I. Uh, well, it's not even that. It's like also, like, if you don't know exactly what you're doing on a large scale, your end product is not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to, you don't want the you don't you want know, to compromise like the quality of it. Exactly, and you can you know tell it. Oh, we like pasteurize or make it or so, but if it still doesn't feel right in your mouth, then like it's just not right. And I just wasn't willing to to do that. Of you know, I I feel real strongly like letting what they do. Like I can make sausage, but I don't. I'll yeah. just go to Parma. <laughs> You know, absolutely. Really good at it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, yeah. I, I mean, like, why would you? Yeah, because that's a whole different art form to do. But uh, that's exactly ca- that's kind of exactly. like how I try to approach things. Like, I'm not a uh, a good graphic designer by any means, but I have good ideas. So whenever I go, I uh, I just find the the best people that I could find to communicate my ideas yep. to because. I mean, why would you try to do something, just pick up and do something that people spent their lives, you know, trying to perfect and learn? Right. Yeah, and also, you know, I feel like there's stuff that I'm I'm really good at. I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on that. But I also like part of it is just knowing your resources, and if you know someone who does something that's beautiful, invite them in. <laughs> you know, invite, invite them in and make them part of your process. Absolutely. That's kind of how we, how we think about things. I, I like that. Uh, I like the way that you approach that for sure. Now, um, now, where does the where does the cookies come into play? Like, like, is that something that you had experience with beforehand? Because you like your company is very, very impressive with the fact that like you know your flavor combinations and how like you know exotic I would call them. You, like you have exotic flavors. You know, did you have experience hey. working with those? Um. Somewhat. I mean, I, I've always baked 
Um, I've always made cookies, and I, so most of the, the original cookies that we made are my family's recipes or my wife's family's recipes. Oh, wow, that's uh, awesome. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, like our sugar cookie, our chocolate chip, our um, peanut butter cookie, um, those are all our family cookies. Speculous cookie, also family cookie. <clears throat> so, um, we just adapted those recipes for a larger scale. Um, and then, as for the combinations, you know, the first year or two, we just kind of like played, you know, just to just to see what happens. And we read a lot, and we also travel a lot. And when we travel, like our main goal is to like taste things and see what pair, pairs well and bring ideas back. Um, so a lot of the combinations that we make, we've had in other formats, probably not ice cream, but like in a dessert somewhere or even in a savory dish. Oh, you yeah. Know, this goes well with this. Let's try it. And, and ice cream is such an, um, a good format because it's fat accepts flavor and it's a blank canvas. So you could really do some fun, fun combinations and fun things with it. And it just kind of takes it. You know, there's not a lot to obscure it. That fresh cream taste can kind of take things on really beautifully. That's interesting to think about that because, like, I see, uh, I see, uh, what was the one I saw? Black sesame and salted tahini. Yeah. Like, that one is, uh, that one's very interesting to me um, because, you know, I, I don't know too much. I'm, I'm pretty, uh, what's the word? I'm adventurous. Like I try pretty much anything and, uh, I like to, you know, try different things. And I'm not saying that that's like, you know, super, super out of the, out of the box to like try, but you know, that's, an, that's better than just a regular, you know, chocolate chip cookie with a vanilla in there. And it's like, it's interesting to see the, you know, the reach that you to take to like, try to, I don't know, like kind of elevate the whole process of it because I mean, yeah, you can make a great ice cream sandwich, and I'm sure it would be great, but it's like if you could make it great and still elevate it a little bit more, that's like kind of what separates, you know, that kind of is what separates you from you to everyone else. Oh, that's it. That's very sweet of you. Thank you. We, um, we really do try to, to push people. Um, because the sandwich is like a familiar format, um, we try to, you know, hook people with, with vanilla and chocolate peanut butter and salted heat and, um, you know, strawberry and, and, and more of like the traditional ice cream flavors. And once we, once we lure them in with the traditional stuff and they trust us, we try to push a little bit farther and a little bit farther to get people to kind of open up their palate and like just try different things because bottom line if you don't like, uh, like, if you try something that's strange, it's still like an, a cookie and ice cream. Exactly. So like, and that's what's so approachable for it's people. It's not a huge risk. Yeah. Yeah, it's not too much of a risk. It's still ice cream. Like, like uh, I saw, I saw, and I wish that I would have been able to try this, but I saw you had a rhubarb flavor, and oh, know, it'll come back. I feel like that. Uh, so, like, my grandmother makes a rhubarb pie for my brother for his, uh, you know, for holidays for him because that's what he favors. But like, I feel like rhubarb is like a flavor that you don't really, you know, see. Like, I kind of equate that as like a, you know, as terrible it is as I say, but like, I imagine like older people liking that. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. But it's uh, an old timey flavor. An old timey flavor, exactly. But I think that like, if more people tried that like they would, you know, they would love it. And like, uh, now did I see somewhere on your Instagram while I was looking, like, did you have like a, a spicy or like a savory flavored one? Yeah, we have a couple spicy ones. So we have a spicy chocolate, uh, with marshmallows in it on a double chocolate chunk. Oh. And that has, um, um, like a pepper mix. Um, so one of our employees, Natalie, her dad, Carl. Shout out to Carl Stafford for being a maniac about spice. But he <laughs> makes this, he's insane. So he makes this dried pepper powder. So it's like 
I don't even know, 10 different kinds of peppers. Yeah. And he dries them and then grinds them, and they're like a dust. Oh, wow. And we put that in. Yes. And it is unbelievable. So we put that in to the spicy chocolate. And then it also goes in our spicy brownie. Oh. So it's like a spicy brownie sundae. So it's actually... It's a, there's a little bit in the ice cream, and then it's really in the chocolate fudge ribbon. Oh wow, that's and I it, I love yeah. that idea. Like I love the idea of like adding like uh, some heat because like sweet heat is like something you often see with like you know sauces or you know seasonings yeah, and everything. Like that. Yeah, yeah, like a sweet heat wing, but like. Uh, I I recently, not recently, it was before COVID, obviously, but uh, I was out to a restaurant somewhere. I think I was in Philly, and uh, we had like a, it was like a chocolate mousse with like a, or like maybe it was a, maybe it was like a lime mousse with like a jalapeno in it, and uh, mm. it was so yeah. good. It was so good because like you figure um, that what made me wanted to try it is like, you know, if I make tacos, they give you like a lime wedge and you sprinkle that on there. And it's like, you got that hot and you got that like savory, like spicy. And I was like, man, I want to try that dessert because like, you know, that's such an interesting combination. And like to my surprise, not really to my surprise, I knew it would be good, but it was just like amazing to like have that. And like you, you take that first bite and you get that, that cold, you know, sweet, creamy feeling, and then at the end, you get that little bit of, like, you get that little burn at the end. Yep, and then you want it more. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> I agree. Keep going, yeah. We, um, we have one other spicy one, and uh, we work with um, a local honey place, uh, Bedillion Honey, and they make their own hot honey. Yes. So we have a hot honey ice cream on a ricotta cookie, so it's almost like, hot honey and biscuits. Oh, wow. And it's fantastic. And, like, the, the spice is pretty significant in that because um, it builds. You know, every bite at the end is a little bit hotter than the last, and it's it's fantastic. But it's it's interesting. I've seen, like, like a 12-year-old just, like, house it and want another one. Oh, yeah. And, like, really? He's like, yeah, I love spice. So I was like, that's so interesting. That's definitely, uh, that's so whenever you were, you know, whenever you and Krista were starting this out, like, were you more reserved about like your flavor profiles that you wanted to use to like, try to like hook people into it. And then like, you were able to like, kind of start branching out a little bit. You know, I don't think it was intentional. I think we started with what we knew. Yeah. Um, and then we both get like bored really easy. So we just kept like trying new things and, you know, and people liked it. So it gave, made us a little bit more bold and we tried a little bit more. And now, now it's very intentional. We try to like find new and interesting combinations um, that we think people will like and that we think we like. But we also now have employees and they all have fantastic palettes um, you know, bring a lot of interesting ideas to the table. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so, uh, I had know, a, now, now it's just not us. It's everybody. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's, what's awesome about like, uh, you know, obviously it's cool that like you, like, this is your company, this is your baby. Like this is what you've built up, but it's awesome whenever people who built the brand and the company from the ground up, like we'll reach out and, you know, accept advice from other people because, you know, like why not accept, you know, creative ideas from other people that like, you know, kind of, because it might not necessarily be exactly what you like, but you know, it's what other people like. And it's, uh, I think that that's important for, you know, uh, the boss, so to speak to, you know, kind of listen to the, listen to the people and try to adapt a little bit to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's actually kind of a job requirement. People have to bring ideas to the table. They have to test them out, you know, like, especially in the colder months when we're a little bit slower. Um, that's our, this is our time. We, we test new flavors and new mix-ins and new combinations. And it's, yeah, it's a job requirement. Every time someone goes somewhere, obviously pre-COVID, like, when they travel, you have to bring back flavor ideas. 
I tell love me that. what you ate. I love that. Tell me, tell me something interesting. Yeah. Now, uh, um, now this is. Uh, I'm going to just try to work in these listener questions because we got about. Uh, we got about. Oh tw- yeah. We got about twenty of them, and I I want to just work them in as they fit. So. Uh, uh, one of them was, did you ever have any flavors that you tried that like completely flopped? Um, let me think. I'm sure. I'm sure there are some. I know some that didn't get out to market because they were just not, they just didn't work. Um, that was another question. Basil? That was another question is like, okay. what, what were some of the flavor, what were some of the prototype flavors that you guys were putting together that just did not make it to the line? Yeah. So, um, a basil flavor, half our staff liked it. The other half was like, tastes like pesto. <laughs> <laughs> pesto. <laughs> it, it, didn't, it didn't go well. Um, then there was a lemongrass and it tasted like weed. <laughs> I mean, really strongly tasted like weed. I was like, I don't think we can sell this. I don't think this is going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, I mean, we learned over the years that are, there are specific flavors that um, are very niche. Oh, yeah. And we could only make a little bit of it and the people that love it eat it up and then no one else is going to buy it. So we've kind of tailored our production. We don't get any flavors because we feel they're fantastic. Um, but we know that they're not going to sell. They're not going to go gangbusters. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes sense, and that's like part of the business. You have to learn what is uh, what's moving and what's not. Did I see a ricotta flavor? Yeah. yeah so that's um, a ricotta cookie. Oh, the ricotta cookie. And yes, but we're also working on one that has ricotta in it in the ice cream. See, so that's that's so interesting. Reveal what that is yet. That's fine, and I, I won't press you on that. But I saw that the ricotta cookie, and I was like, you know, uh, it's so interesting to see all these like wild flavors that you would never really like think about it. And one of the questions is like, what is a mistake? Uh, that turned out awesome that like was kind of just like something fun that like you kind of ran with um so well the cinnamon was one of my first flavors I accidentally I'm sorry I'm sorry you you cut out there okay so the cinnamon ice cream yes which is one of our first ice creams that we put out um, I accidentally took on cinnamon and it dumped into the ice cream. Um, you, uh, all the cinnamon dumped in there. Yeah. So that was an accident and it turned out fantastic and it's one of the first. Wow. That's interesting. That's definitely, yeah. uh, that's cool. Yeah. That was a, a long time ago. Um, what else was an accident? Oh, um, so uh, we get these really beautiful solitaires and we cook them down to get some of the, you know, the oil out of it. So one of our employees, a long time ago, um, I got to San Jacano and overcooked the cherries and they cooked down to like a thick syrup and they ended up killing themselves in their own juice. Oh, wow. And that is not all how we make our um, like whole cherries that go into um, our ice cream. Wow, that's so interesting. So the cookie or the cherries, yeah. that, the cherries were on too long and they candied inside themselves. Yes. Wow. So they just turned into like sticky, sweet, but also still sour. They're fantastic. Um, but yeah, they were. That was definitely an accident. That's a that's a cool accident that uh that that had a silver lining. I like that. Yep. What is yep. now? What about what about like what's one of the trickiest flavors that you had to like develop that uh you know took a little bit of time to perfect? Hmm. Well, I mean, so it took probably six months to figure out how to get the marshmallow in 
like, first of all, the right marshmallow and um, get it in the middle of the ice cream sandwich. Yes. We do um, the s'mores, it's got the core of marshmallow. Um, that took a long time and it was very sticky. Yeah, I bet. Very messy. Um, it's still really sticky and messy. Um, but one of our one of our first employees, her name's Lindsay, she lives in Alaska now, but she figured it out and it was considerable amount of time and effort. Um, that, that, that was definitely like a very tricky one. Um, and I guess the other one that is the most work um, is our Italian rainbow cookie pint. Italian we rainbow do cookie it pint. One time. Yes. Do you know what Italian rainbow cookies are? I do know what they are, yes. Okay. So it is like a multiple day process to make those cookies. Why is that? And then you have to chop them. So it's basically you make three different cakes uh, and then you okay. have to let them cool and then you have to put them together and let them set and then you have to cover them with chocolate and let that set and then you have to chop it up. So it's like, it's so time consuming. Yeah. We only do it once. Well, that's, once a year. that's understandable. That's probably the, one of the yeah. sought after flavors. Um, I, I can't remember the one that I had. I think I had... Uh, did you do like a Rocky Road with a graham cracker cookie? Um, we had done a Rocky Road and it's on a chocolate chunk cookie. But then we have our... Um, the one that's on the graham is um, s'mores. Uh, that's what it so was. Like, s'mores on the graham. Yeah. That was so yeah. good. That was one of my favorite ones that I've had so far. Awesome. Yeah, that's a fun one. I uh, I recently, like I said, I was late to it. I've, I'm very transparent on these podcasts. I don't I don't pretend to be, <laughs> you know, the biggest fan of anyone on here. I just I'm very real about it. And I was walking through Market District, and I saw a whole wall of coolers with just all the cookies in there. So we bought four of them. I can't even remember the flavors because uh, I picked two and my wife picked two, but all of them were. You know, really just like very like we tried to pick unique ones that we never had before that we like flavors of ice mm-hmm. creams and cookies that we've never had. And there was one that had that was on like a, a snickerdoodle cookie. But like the cookies are so good and the ice cream is so good. That's what's so uh, that's what like kind of, you know, spurred me to like try to, you know, get an interview with you too, because it's like. It's not just like a base, you know, like a, like a, it's not a terrible quality cookie or terrible quality ice cream that's like overshadowing the other. They are both so good and so interesting a flavor. Um, I just like, I think it's very, very, uh, I think it's fun that you're to the point now where you could like keep pushing the envelope and keep trying different things and keep like trying to, you know, elevate flavors. Yeah, yeah, it is fun. And and it's always tricky, too, to add something new because um, we, sometimes I feel like we're dedicated to doing things the hard way. Um, so we try to make all of our flavors from scratch. We make all the candy that goes in, we make it, the marshmallows, they're homemade marshmallows, oh, wow. marshmallow fluff, all that. Yeah, every single thing that goes in it is is we make um so like when you're putting out a new cookie like you have to test it and test it and test it and then put it with ice cream and then test it that way and then let it sit for three weeks in the freezer and test it that way so it's like it's definitely a process that's interesting the time that it has to sit because uh you know that's uh I feel like that a lot of people don't even think about that is like something could be tasting delicious and like fresh, but you know, is it going to hold up in the freezer the same way and still be just as delicious? Right. Exactly. And move it around from the free one freezer to another freezer because you know, they go from our freezer to the grocery store to someone's freezer at home, which is infinitely less cold yeah. <laughs> than any of our freezers. Absolutely. Like our professional freezers. Um, so we just try to like make sure that it's all it's, it's quality holds up. What is uh what is your personal favorite flavor that you have uh, created? 
Oh, wow. That's a tough one because it's like... Do you know how many different hard. ones you have? Um, yes. So we've made probably well over 200 flavors between pints and sandwiches. Jeez. Um, but, you know, some of them don't come back. Um, so we currently have probably around 100 in rotation. Yeah that we rotate through. Um, but so right now, my favorite right now is um, cookie cream. And it's like, we make wafers, like chocolate wafer cookies and pound them up. And that's what flavors the ice cream. Oh, wow. So it's like cookies and cream, but you like eat it and it the whole thing tastes like an onion. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But in the summer, in the summer, one of my favorites is lemon blueberry on shortbread. Lemon or, blueberry on shortbread? Is that what you said? Lemon blueberry? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Or maybe, I, I love our fruits. A, a plum on a ginger molasses is also like one of my favorites. It's more of a late autumn flavor that's uh Fantastic. those are such a that's such an interesting you know like a plum on uh like i don't know that's just crazy um now I'm, like i said i'm gonna just work in some questions that kind of uh yeah that are that, that kind of fit in uh so someone said your favorite store-bought cookie like what are like like what's your like your favorite like what was your go-to like growing up oh god so <laughs> I was not really allowed to have a lot of sugar growing up, so maybe that explains why I now make ice cream for a living. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just like, oh no, I'm going to eat as much sugar as I want. Yeah, that's um, the best. Yeah, so, you know, like, we didn't really have a lot of store-bought cookies. Cause we didn't have, they were expensive. Yeah. Like, store cookies were expensive. So, if we were going to have cookies, they were going to be uh, going to be made. But I guess my favorite from being at other people's houses um, and getting to eat cookies at their house, um, I loved like the soft, um, oh gosh, what are they? Uh, I can't remember what they're called. They're like in the blue, they're chocolate chip cookies. Trips they're Ahoy? Trips Ahoy? Trips Ahoy. Okay. Yeah. The, the soft and chewy ones. Yes. Oh, so good. You can eat a you can eat a whole box so of good. them. I know. I know. Um, that's yeah, a that's that a good pick. Of... That's a good pick. Yeah. What about uh now uh, another question? Are you a chocolate or vanilla person? Vanilla. Oh wow! Interesting. Uh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm a chocolate person, but it's always interesting to know Are what you? people favor. Yeah, I, I'm like a yeah, chocolate I, fiend. Like I could, uh, I could just, I, I don't, I don't mind vanilla. I, I love vanilla very much. But uh, if I could choose, I like a chocolate fudgy. You know, I also love texture. I'm someone with texture. Uh, so if it's like uh, my favorite ice cream of all time uh, is not even made anymore. It was a, uh, it was like some. I don't know if it was like Giant Eagle brand or something like that. But it was a Rocky Road. But they had the full marshmallows in there but it's impossible sure. to find them anywhere uh but that was my favorite that was my go-to growing up but if i had to choose between right. you know chocolate or vanilla it was always a chocolate flavor nice yeah you know i think i used to always be chocolate and then i realized what real vanilla is to me. yes um because it's it's not something i really grew up with like real vanilla is thing in regular food yeah um and then i had like real true vanilla and i was blown away yeah so i kind of i kind of changed now i'm a vanilla person that's uh that's good i mean that that's uh that's a, that, that's understandable for sure. Um, I'm just looking at all these questions that we have that that kind of uh, go that kind of go in. Someone said, uh, "Were there any extreme flavors test batches uh, that didn't make the cut?" We talked about the basil one. 
But uh, is there any that you love? Like, so this is what's fascinating to me about people that run, you know, restaurants or any sort of business in general. It's uh, the way to separate what you personally like to what people will respond to. So is there any sort of flavors that you loved yourself that you were like, I don't think that this is going to work on a bigger scale? Yeah. So um, we made sticky toffee pudding ice cream. And it's like a big British dessert. Like in England, everybody loves sticky toffee pudding. It's a big holiday thing. And it's basically like a date cake. So it's really dense. Um, And then you pour like a bourbon caramel over it and then let it soak in. It's fantastic. And then we chop that up and put it into a bourbon ice cream. It was unbelievable and nobody bought it. (laughs) Really? They don't know what sticky toffee pudding is. Yeah, I didn't know what that was. I wasn't going to interrupt you, but I had no idea what that was. Yeah, no, unless you're like British or more recently watch the Great British Bake Off. And even then it's not a ton, it's not like super prevalent. Yeah. But yeah. Um, wow, that's interesting. Um, that, that one is one of my faves. That sounds yeah. like a very interesting flavor with bourbon ice cream. That sounds real good. Um, it is real good. <laughs> Now, uh, someone said, how do you get, or it says, uh, yeah, how do you get all of the cookies to be the exact same size? Now, can I make a guess at this? Do you? You can, but I won't tell you. Oh, yeah, okay. That's fine. That's fine. I'll, I, I yeah, accept that. We have one secret, and that's it. <laughs> oh, okay. I like that. Um, well, I won't even make a guess. I won't even make it. Um, okay. I, I was, I was going to say that you rolled them out into a sheet and just cut them, but uh, we'll just move to the next one. Uh <laughs> what uh what is your favorite Wilkinsburg business besides yourselves, obviously? Ooh tricky. I know it's um, tricky. These are loaded couple. questions. They're great questions. So um I love um Casey Renee just moved in. She is Casey Renee Confection. She does she was the um pastry chef at his hotel. Um, super talented. He's fantastic. Um, and then I really like this. It's like, I think, nine o'clock cafe or cafe on nine. It is right on, uh, it's 900 Wood Street. Um, 900 Wood Street, you said? Really, yeah, yeah. So it's in like um, a kind of a strange pop-up space. But she started maybe two years ago. I'm not sure if they're active at the moment because they cook outside. Yeah. Um, their food is fantastic. Um, and then there's side uh side Caribbean, which is really, really good. I'm realizing all of these are food places. Um, oh, there's two other ones that I have to mention that are fantastic. Go ahead. One, one is um, Clark. I'm going to mispronounce his last name, Morelia or Morella. He is a leather worker. He makes like really beautiful leather goods. I've never heard of that. Um, Oh, it's awesome. Um, He makes like bags and like wallets and belts and things like that. And then Love It Sundries. Okay, there we go. Love It Sundries. Yeah, they're fantastic. They they make all of their stuff in house, and it's all like really just nice, nice hand motion. Um, they now, do like beard care for men. Oh wow, I'm gonna have to go into there. Yeah, I love a nice beard oil. Uh, can so you? Can you tell me the first two names that you mentioned before? Because uh, it, I, I, I'm going to preface this whole podcast in the intro with saying that, uh, you know, whenever we have phone interviews or interviews over uh, uh, long distance interviews, that sometimes the audio cuts out a little bit and people understand that. But what were the two first businesses that you said? Um, Casey Renee Confections. Casey Renee Confections. 
and she is yeah. the or she confections is the, by Casey Renee. Confections by Casey Renee, and she is the one that is at yeah. Ace Hotel, right? She used to be the pastry chef at the Ace Hotel. Okay, yeah. okay. And then um, I said, "Did I say Fireside?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did. Yeah, that was it. Fireside, yep. and you said that that was the one that was Brilliant. outdoors. That was what? That was outdoors. Is that what you said? The one that was outdoors? Oh no, that's um, that's uh, nine hundred, like Cafe Nine. Oh, Cafe Nine. Cafe that was nine. it. Yeah, Cafe Nine. Yeah. I uh, yeah. I yeah. That's um, a... And then I forgot. There's one more. Knox Land. Knox Land. And it's Knox Land and like K N O T Z. Yeah. They make um upcycled um, bow ties. Oh, wow. So they do, yeah, so they take um, textiles that would otherwise go in the landfill and they make these really awesome bow ties. The owner, um, you should think, well, she's fantastic. Yeah, I would... And uh... so talented. I'm going to ask you to send me these places right after uh, so I could uh, you know, put them on my list of people to get on this podcast to talk to. Yeah. Um, a couple other questions. Do you locally source any of your ingredients? As much as possible. Yeah. So our dairy is from central Pennsylvania. Um, our, all of our fruit is local um, besides lemons and limes and bananas, of course. Yes. Um, but yeah, like all of our berries are grown locally. All of our mint we grow on site. We have a garden um, in the front of our building. And so we grow all of our own mint. Um, and like any apples are all like a local orchard. Yeah, That's... so we work um, as much as possible getting oh. getting things locally. And if, and if it's stuff like chocolate, um, you know, that we we buy through a local company who distributes. I like that. I mean, I like I like the way that you say it, like as much as we can, because obviously you can't do. I mean, obviously you can't source everything as local as you can, but uh, the things that you can do, it's nice that uh, you take the you know the consideration to to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just um, uh, changed our pint supplier and. We now they're you know it's a local company. Oh, that's, um, that's they, great. Yeah, so rather than working out of state, it's someone to, it's closer to home. So that's good. We try to keep as much of our money as possible in the local economy. Got to do it. Um, now, uh, someone said, "Where are they located?" And how much are the ice cream sandwiches? So, for people that don't know, uh, can you rattle off? You know some locations that they are? Yeah, yeah. So, first of all, we we don't have a storefront. We are wholesale only. So, what that means is that we sell to grocery stores, breweries, um, corner markets, restaurants, you know, all of the above. Um, But we don't have a physical location that you could come and purchase the ice cream. So, um, I'm going to direct everyone to our website, um, it's leonaspgh.com, and um, there we have a full list of all of the places that we sell to. So um, we're soon to be in all five Giant Eagle market districts. Um, the last one uh, that we're not in yet is in Wexford. We're going in the beginning of March. And so where they all those Giant Eagles were in the east, we're at... Um, Bryant Street Market, Fifty uh, Second Street Market, the East End Food Co-op. We're at D's. We're at D's in Murraysville. Um, and you know, going south, we're in Heisler's, which is a little grocery store in McMurray. Um, Wait, where are you at, in McMurray? And, uh, it's called Heisler's. Heisler's because I just store is I just moved over here and I've been looking uh, and I uh, I need a place to to go grab a couple. My wife uh, she's only had one and we've been looking to grab a couple more. But I'm gonna I'm gonna definitely put that on my list. Yeah, Heisler's. Um, we just I just delivered there today, 
and uh, we're all the way out into West Virginia at a barbecue joint called Hangover Barbecue, and fantastic, totally worth the drive to pick up some really great ribs. Yeah, I would love that. Um, yeah, and you know, up north, we're um, at a place called Wheelfish. We're at um, a new market called Peaches Farm Market. We're at Chanel Farm Market. Um, How many locations yeah, are you guys so at? Um, so pre-pandemic, we were at like eighty. Wow. And now, yeah, now we're at probably like fifty. That's still that's still a pretty good that's still a pretty good uh, return for you know the whole the whole world oh, shutting yeah. down. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Now, so, uh, could I ask um, you a, a question uh, as far as you know, like uh, your business model? So you said you don't have a, a like a brick and mortar store. You know, wh- what is your correct. what's what's like the the thought behind that, and why you you haven't chose to do that? Just kind of keep the the overhead yeah. cost down. Um, yeah, partly. So we started um, out of the back of Zeke's Coffee. Oh, and really? I didn't we were know that. Everything there. Yeah, we were there for like three months, and we uh, we we needed more space. So um, while we were there, we got contacted by Fifty Second Street Market um, and Bryant Street Market, and they were like, "Oh, we heard about your ice cream. Can we can we carry it?" And in our minds dropping ice cream off and picking up a check is a whole lot easier than selling them one at a time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And we didn't have any employees. We didn't have the time jobs. We didn't have the time. We certainly didn't have the money to set up shop. Um, And, you know, like, so we just made the decision right then. Let's be where other people are instead of making them come to us. I like that. Um, It allowed us yeah, it allowed us to grow a lot bigger without a lot of overhead. Um, and, you know, right now we still only have like, you know, eight employees. We would have to have those eight employees plus a whole crew of people working a storefront plus rental, you know, double the overhead. You couldn't make it where you're selling it and it was just... It got really like overwhelming, and we just were like, "It's just not, it's not for us." Yeah, it's not for us. So we just continued to kind of grow in this model, and you know, as soon as the pandemic hit, like I, I knew we didn't want it, but we really knew it was a blessing that we didn't have to close any stores or we didn't have to close anything. Absolutely. So it really, we we're like, okay, <laughs> it, we made a good decision a long time ago. To, yeah. Like, yeah, that makes a lot of it's sense for sure. Yeah. That definitely makes a lot of sense for sure. I mean, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix yeah. it. And we if didn't you... have to lay anyone. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the now I uh, I wanted to know, like, like uh, when you're making, like, w- when you're making these cookies, like, are you able to, like, you know, Give me any sort of like you know numbers of how many you make of each of these, or is that like a is that a business secret? Yeah. No, no. Um, so I mean, everything has to be double because there's two cookies per sandwich. So you know, on a on a heavy baking day, the person on the oven would be baking probably between eighteen hundred and. 2,200 cookies. Holy shit. In a day. Yeah. And then we do that five days a week. Now, do you do just like, uh, wow, that's crazy. Um, how far yeah. out, how far out do you plan your menu? Um, so we plan out about two weeks in advance. So oh, that's not too bad right now. Like, no, no. Um, and then they bake, you know, a week ahead of time. Yeah. Now, do you do it's, you it's like that, that. do you make spur of the moment like uh, you know last minute like oh we're gonna make this flavor instead or are you kind of like you know you need the time to prepare and you need the you know um, sometimes so like there was a a glitch in our ability to get chocolate one you know one week 
So we couldn't make any of the chocolate flavors that we had planned. So we had to go and look at what we had, what we had on hand, what we could substitute quickly, um, and make those changes. Being small allows us to be flexible like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we can, we have a pretty solid team that is, is great about being flexible. That's and, great. Uh, you know, making, making changes when needed. That's awesome. Um, so, like, what are your goals within, like, the next, you know, couple years? Oh, gosh. Well, we would like to, obviously, be in all the journeys. Um, we would like to, um, you know, basically grow not too much bigger, but to the point where we, because um, there's, like, a sweet spot, right? Yeah. If you grow too big, you need to like scale up everything, which limits your ability to make money because you're buying new equipment, you're buying new space, you're buying all this stuff, and you're not making any money because you're just paying on those loans. Yes. So our goal is to like grow just a little bit more to that sweet spot and then just kind of continue to focus on the creativity and not necessarily on the growth. Um, and just be able to enjoy a you know, enjoy your company. Absolutely. You know, like provide good jobs, you know, like hitting that sweet spot allows us to pay our employees more, allows us to, you know, I like take that. more paid days off. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like we'll allow our staff to do it, to those, those kind of things and really build um, that solid foundation of a, of a, you know, company that people want to work for. That's a uh, that's a really good answer. I think that that's a that's a swell answer because, like you said, if you it's like almost if you get too big, you have to just you're basically restarting over, and uh, you have to yeah. re- reinvest everything into that, and you got to come up with you know different ratios to make these batches bigger, and you know uh, those are all things that are factors that I feel like a lot of people don't you know take into consideration. And that's what, like, that's what one of my goals with the podcast whenever I interview people is to kind of, like, shed light on things that that some people don't really, you know, that some people don't really, like, understand or, like, take in consideration and, you know, for them to be able to, like, kind of hear from your point of view and why you choose to do things the way you do and why you choose to do things that you don't do. And uh, I think that that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Now, uh, so again, I have to, you know, just apologize, you know, and say thank you for being such like a, a great sport talking to me over the phone and doing this interview over the phone. Ideally, I would have loved to, you know, had you in studio, but obviously, you know, we're, we're trying to both be safe and we're trying to both be, uh, you know, uh, do our part to keep things going well. But, uh, could I move? Can I move to the ending segment of the podcast? I mean, is there anything that you think yeah. that I didn't touch on with you? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, I don't think so either. I always get I always get anxiety whenever uh, I don't know. I get anxiety whenever I'm interviewing over the phone because I, I don't know why I feel like it's such a different thing. But uh, I'm just trying to read over all these questions and make sure I. Oh, the last question: Do you have any vegan options? Yeah. And I see that you. I see that your website, it says 100% real dairy, 100% lactose free, so that every belly can enjoy. Now, does that mean... Yes. Does that, is that vegan? No. Okay. No, lactose is just uh, milk sugar. Okay. So, it's the, it's the disaccharide that your body has a hard time breaking down. So, we break it down first into its component sugars. Um, which doesn't change anything except you don't get sick. Yeah. So we don't currently have any vegan options. Um, someday. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm sure that's a, that's a whole different beast that you have to slay. It is. It is. And it also, it's one of those things where there is a really fantastic vegan ice cream company in Pittsburgh. And I would rather push people towards them um, than try to do it myself. 
Because, okay. like, let's be real, it is a very specific skill set to have a beautifully done vegan ice cream and have it taste good and feel good in your mouth. And they have killed it. And I just, it's just not our, not our forte. That's and I, you know, people are, are always like, oh, well, you should, like, start making cakes because you bake and you should do this and you should do that. And when you, when you start to kind of dilute yourself yeah, um, and your skill set, then you don't do anything well. I'd yeah. rather do one thing really well than, like, five things mediocre. Oh, yeah, I love that. So, that's so good. Yeah, so a- anyone who wants vegan options for ice cream, go to Sugar Spell Scoops in Sharpsburg. It is unbelievably delicious. I've never heard of them. Yeah, they're relatively new, maybe two years. Um, and they're just kind of right down on the main drag, uh, right by Dancing Gnome, it's across the street. And uh, it's fantastic. They're, they do a very good job. Well, that's that's uh that's very uh I don't know is the right word admirable that uh some people are gonna some people would be like you know I don't want to name drop another you know competitor or something but uh if I mean if yeah that's awesome uh, sugar spell yeah, scoops that's fantastic. okay now yeah. uh, if we back in the day when we were doing events um, if someone's like oh do you have any vegan options we have two vegans I would just go to the That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, Okay, so the ending segment that I do with all my guests on the podcast is an ending segment called Desert Island Questions. Desert Island Questions is whenever I give each guest three categories to take with them on a desert island to exhaust until they expire. Um. The first category to take with you is things to watch on a desert island. So you get you get three picks of things to watch. So if you have a TV okay. and you have a DVD player and you could pick three movies, what would they be? Movies? Oh, wow. Um, the Labyrinth. Oh, that's a good one. Yep. Um... The last Harry Potter. Oh, so good. My wife refuses to so watch good. Harry Potter. It makes me sick. What? She, it makes me sick. What? She, she said, and, and, and my wife likes, you know, she loves witches. She loves like practical magic movies like that. But she will not sit down and watch Harry Potter with me. She's like, I don't need to watch that. And I'm just like, oh, like, how dare you? Like, do not. Let's blast so good. <laughs> So good. Yeah, it uh, is. It's so um, good. And my third movie. Um, oh my gosh! Can I substitute it for a, a series of television show? Absolutely. Uh, Schitt's Creek. Oh. The collected season, all of the seasons. How good is it? So good. So good. So yeah. good. I really, uh, Daniel and Eugene Levy are just like, I, I don't know. They are such a great. I, I like such a great pair and uh then you have Mora in there and she's hilarious too all the characters are hilarious i have uh i've watched probably like i don't know i'm working my way through it slowly uh we just got this dog and we haven't watched anything recently but uh i really <laughs> have enjoyed every single episode that i've watched of that yeah it's so good Okay, so uh, now uh, my next question I usually ask is three books to take on a desert island, but I'm going to switch it up with you, uh, and I will let you pick okay. three of your ice cream sandwiches that you could have. Only three, though. Only three. Okay. Um, vanilla and chocolate chunk. Okay. Absolutely o- classic. Old classic. Um. Yes. Um... Blueberry on oatmeal lace. Okay. And black sesame. 
Oh, okay. How about uh, how yeah, about this? Yeah. Yesterday, whenever I posted the picture of uh, you know the ice cream sandwiches and said that I was going to have you on here, my mother called me. Uh, she listens to all the podcasts. She loves it. And she was like, oh, my God. She was like, I've been meaning to go down and get this lace cookie that I've seen on Instagram for three weeks. She was like, it's crazy that you just posted that. And I was like, look at that right there. That means that I'm doing something right. My That's mother, great. my mother, uh, I'm going to have to uh, get her an ice cream sandwich and take it to her house. Um but uh, okay, so the and uh, now those are three all good three options. I'd like to try the black sesame. Uh, I think that that would be really really delicious. Um, and the third category that I give everyone is three CDs to take on a desert island. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I don't really know if I'm redheaded stranger. Oh wow! Okay. Yes. Um. Ani DeFranco, Living in Clip. Okay. Um, oh, God. This is so hard. I know. These are um, hard questions. Yeah. It's hard to finish. Ooh, you know what? The thing is that was. Is, that, is it that was? Yeah. In the Night Sweats. Wait, who is it? His most recent. So it's Nathaniel Ratliff. Oh, okay. I couldn't hear you at first. I can't remember the... Yeah, I cannot remember the name of the album. But it's the latest one he put out as solo. And it is like... Start to finish Biggie. It's just so good. All right. So, All right. yeah. Okay. my tree. Um, okay, so uh, now uh, I have three more questions for you. The next one is going to be a death row meal. So the death row meal is, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those morbid articles about people that are about to be on death row. They get one last meal. Yeah. What would your meal be? You get to pick whatever you want to eat from wherever you want as much as you would like. Um, I would probably have my mother-in-law make um linguine alioli with shrimp what is aliori uh, i'm sorry what what did you you said linguine what alioli what is it's what is like, that so it's basically olive oil and like an insane amount of garlic oh okay and saute it it's just like a super simple dish and then you put, um, like, chopped up basil and parsley in that, and you toss it um, in the, with pasta and cooked shrimp. Well, you, you saute the shrimp in the garlic and oil, so it's all, like, in there. And then you just toss it together, and you put toasted breadcrumbs and parmesan on top. It sounds delicious. That was, like... A big salad it's like comfort food that sounds very and delicious so, yes that would send me to the gallows happy okay that's a good answer <laughs> um <laughs> Okay, so the second to last question, I am sponsored by Turner Premium Iced Tea, the uh, or Turner Dairy Farms, the creators of Turner's Premium Iced Tea, and uh, I usually have something called the Turner's Crate, where uh, I give each, where I let every previous guest I've had submit a question in there, but I've kind of scrapped that idea with the whole pandemic thing, and I've been asking everyone, mm-hmm. if you could walk into a gas station on the beginning of a road trip, and all you could pick is one snack, what would it be? Um, it would be um, legit Turner's uh, chip dip, like the onion, chip Turner's onion dip. Oh, my God, yes. And a bag of, like, wavy lays. A hundred percent. What a good... Oh, my God. Yeah, that's a good choice. I could, uh, a whole it's tub so of it. good. A whole tub of it. Yeah. And it's like... When we used to be able to go to parties, like, no matter what, even if I made, like, Japanese pull-apart milk bread that's, like, amazing and beautiful, I would also show up with a bag of Lay's and a tub of Turner's. (laughs) And no lie, it was, like, flies on shit. People would just (laughs) walk. And, like, all of a sudden, you come up for air and all the dip's gone. 
<laughs> there's like, you know, a huge spread of food and alcohol and it's like everyone's focused on the chip dip. I mean, so, what, yeah, what's yeah. better? What's more of a classic and what's better than some chips and dip? No, it's just, it's fantastic. You could get lost in it and the whole thing's gone and then you feel bad about yourself. Yeah. But then you just crack another one. It's fine. Yep. That's perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the, the last question that I ask everyone is if you could have a conversation with anyone alive or dead, who would it be and why? Oh, anyone alive or dead. Um... Now, let me, let me stop you real quick. And you can say a loved okay. one because that's obvious, I feel. But because that's obvious, I would like you to say someone who is not, you know, related to you in any way or, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would like to speak with Alice B. Toklas. She, um, she lived in, do you know, do you know who she is? I do not. Okay, so, um, hold, hold on one second now. Get my facts right. Okay. Yeah. Take your time. It says uh, it says she was born April thirtieth, eighteen seventy seven, and died March seventh, nineteen sixty seven. Yeah. She was an American born yeah. member of the Parisi- Parisian avant garde of the early twentieth century. Yeah. Yeah. So she lived with Gertrude Stein, who was born in Pittsburgh on the north side. Um. They were longtime like lovers uh, in you know Paris avant garde, but they had she cooked. She was um, a very good cook, and she wrote this book. Um, it's a it's a cookbook basically, but also like kind of a biography of her life with Gertrude Stein in Paris during the twenties. The autobiography of Alice B. Tokus? Yes. So there's also, like, there's, she was, it's told, anyway, she's fascinating. She did a lot of, um, like, work with food as well as art, and she's just fascinating, kind of, like, a weirdo, and I just think that she would be, the most interesting person to talk to. That's a fantastic answer, and I'm glad that I have it pulled up on uh, Wikipedia because I'm going to look into who she is. Uh, I think yeah. that that's pretty interesting. Very cool. Wow. Yeah, she's very cool. And, and she was like, Gertrude Stein was like the one who was like the famous writer and and like just very commanding presence, and Alice was just kind of like her partner. So she didn't necessarily get as much fanfare. Yeah. But she saw and heard everything. So I feel like she would just be so fascinating. Uh, she looks fascinating. She looks like she would be an interesting person to talk to for sure. Definitely. Um, well, I just want to say thank you so much for sitting down with me for an hour and a half and talking to me about your business. I... I could not be more thankful and I wish that this could have been in person and that we could have had, you know, that, that in-person vibe, but I think it went very well. What about you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me and, um, bearing with all of my (laughs) uncertainty with tithing and all that. No, absolutely. I get it completely. And, uh, I think that that just adds to, uh, that adds to the get. I mean, you, you, you do everything like, like yins are doing all the things yourselves. And I think that that adds to, you know, uh, you know, that adds to the whole story of it all. Like you deliver the, like you just said, I del- I was just out there today and I delivered these ice cream sandwiches. And, uh, I think that that's so awesome that you're such a, you know, hands on part of the business and like that you're, that you're still so involved with it because obviously yins are growing pretty big. I mean, everywhere you look, everywhere you see things, uh, everyone that I follow on Instagram, I always see posts and pictures of Leona's ice cream sandwiches. And, uh, I mean, what, what's more to say about it? I mean, I, it's a, it's a great name in the city and, uh, I'm excited to have been able to sit down and talk with you about it. Wow. Thank you. 
I appreciate it. Absolutely. Will you take a second and please uh, plug anything you would like to plug? Oh, um, I mean, all the people I really wanted to talk about, I talked about. Okay. I mean, you plug yourself. Plug uh, yourself. Where could people find the Instagram, the website? Uh, oh, yeah. So uh, people can follow us on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter at Leona's LLC and find out all about new flavors and uh, check out our website, leonaspgh.com, for all of the locations and uh, pictures and all the good stuff about our ice cream in Pittsburgh. All the good stuff. Um, well, thank you again very, very much. I will put all that in the description. Um, everyone else that's listening, I appreciate it as usual. Uh, please take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast and follow uh, me and Leona's LLC on Instagram and you know, hop down to a local store and grab yourself an ice cream sandwich. But thanks for listening, and I'll call you right back. <laughs>